Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Sheila, and I am the Director of Marketing and Business Development for Advantage Industries. We are a managed service provider based in Columbia, Maryland, and we also have a very strong focus on cybersecurity and compliance. And I'm very excited to have this presentation today. We have a strategic partnership with Dell and all the Dell family we have for many years. And this is our second webinar that we're doing with one of their subject matter experts. And this program is very interesting to me in particular. Cybersecurity, it seems like it's in the news every day and more and more. And I don't care if your company has two employees or 200,000. Cybersecurity matters to your business. And there are some people that will say, well, well, I, I'm not in this industry, so I don't have a compliance regulatory. And I will say to you, every state has cybersecurity laws as a bare minimum. And then with that, there are several best practices that you can follow. If you're in medical, you're following HIPAA. If you are in retail, you're following PCI. If you have clients in Europe, you're following GDPR. And today we're going to talk about uh, the granddaddy of compliance, which is NIST, that everybody can and should follow. And then built upon that, the Department of Defense has now mandated a brand new compliance called Cyber Maturity Model Certification, or CMMC for short. So if you are not a government contractor, you're still going to get a ton of value out of this program as far as best practices and things that you should start doing today. If you are a government contractor and you have not started working on your CMMC, and I'm going to give a little qualification to what working on CMMC means, you need to start that now. Because as Lauren and I are going to describe over the next 45 minutes, this is a process that takes time and takes a financial investment. And you want to be ready because nothing would be worse than getting your next bid from the DOD and finding that CMMC requirement line on there not being able to put in your certification and you having to pass on a bid or not get a renewal for a contract that you've had in place for many years. So before we get into the presentation, Lauren Larson, brilliant guy, a, a fellow cyber nerd, really spends as much time in this space as I do talking with clients on a regular basis about their cybersecurity data hygiene best practices, solutions, software, equipment, touch, touch them all because Lauren is exceptional at this platform. So Lauren, why don't you give our audience just a couple minutes about you and your role at Dell? Okay. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Um, so I am Lauren Larson. I am a uh, cybersecurity strategist with the Dell End User Computing Unit. And what we do is we work with our clients to help them ensure that they have a secure profile in their IT environment. Um, I've been working with Dell going back to 2016. I was, I was hired to come on board and start up a security assessment program with them. That was my main focus. And I've been doing that now going on this next year, be five years, I guess. Um, prior to that, I've been doing information assurance work with federal agencies in the Washington, D.C. area going back to 2005. Um, I've been working, if you, if these are all non-federal agencies, um, but it is the work of the NIST 853 series that was mostly what I've been working on with these organizations. I've been an assessor of them. In addition, I've been a third party assessor for FedRAMP clients who are going for their certification for FedRAMP uh, programs so that they can sell to the government. Um, so I've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, as Mike said, it's a bit nerdy. I've been a nerd for this stuff going on since 2005. Um, my nerd speak with some of our clients is what helps us get, you know, in the door and help them working them out. But anyway, enough of that. Um, so what what we were looking at here is the CMMC and the NIST 800-171. Um, this program, what we're going to go through today is going to tell you a little bit of the difference about the two and what it means for an organization in terms of going forward and trying to make sure that they are going to meet the compliance requirements that are now set forth. This is not going away. 
And as Mike <laughs> said, this is going to be an expensive endeavor for those who have not done anything yet. And it's a very time consuming process. This is, these are the two main takeaways that you need to get from today's program. It's that this isn't going away and this is something that's going to be consuming of your resources in order to get it done. So is that kind of hit the mark where we were looking for, Mike? Yeah, I think so. And you and I were talking yesterday to prepare for today. And you brought up a really good point that I want to reinforce. So many government contractors, subs or primes, let me, let me point that out. You subs are not off the hook. <laughs> subs or primes have labored under the delusion for years. Well, I'm following this. So this isn't going to be a big deal. And DO, the DOD did an independent study and found that over 80% of government contractors, subs and primes, that thought they were following this standards would fail even a peripheral NIST audit. Over 80%, which means eight out of 10 of you that are listening to this, you're not ready. You're not even close to ready. And that, and I, I know I'm beating this over the head, but start now. <laughs> start now. So Lauren, start now. All right. So what I've got here is a presentation. I'm going to run through it quickly. It's not going to, I'm not going to go too long or in too much detail unless you have a question about specific pages. But what I like to do is highlight the difference between what is now the CMMC versus the NIST 800-171. Um, let me see if I can get this go to the next. And slide. Lauren, maybe along the way, we'll bust some of the myths too. Yes. Like the Google myth, for, for example. Right. Just a little tease. Gotcha. All right. So <laughs> NIST 800-171 is a set of standards that was developed to, as Mike introduced, set up federal contractors so that they can be in a much more secure posture when it comes to controlling unclassified information. Um, most notably, though, the DOD is the one that started out with this. This is not going to stop with the DOD. This is going to spread throughout the entire federal uh, spectrum of federal agencies, both civilian and non, uh, I mean, civilian and federal agencies. And the DIBs, the defense industry based groups, are the first ones to get picked on. So this is where we're starting with this. Um, it's been going on for quite some time. Essentially, what this was is the opportunity where Anyone who has got sensitive but unclassified information that they're using with or sharing from government agencies, you're going to follow under this category eventually. Um, CUI is something that has become extremely valuable for hackers and even your competitors and so forth. And so this is what has been established to help prevent any problems for the federal government. They do not like to see problems. This is the structure right now for the NIST 800-171. There are 14 domain capabilities. Um, they run from access control all the way down to system information integrity. The, what this is, is the NIST 853 version, but in a light version. This is applied specifically to civilian agencies where they, civilian entities where they strip out government specific um, controls that apply to government agencies based on, you know, administrative things that the government has in place for. So this came out, you all had to do this. You all had to self-assess your cybersecurity capabilities at one point. And then if you found that you had problems, you came up with a poem. So that was nice. Um, the DFARS and everybody thought, well, we've got this in place, but we really weren't seeing a lot of improvement. And as Mike was saying, if you were to go out now and, and review any of the companies that are saying they're now complying under 171 for a CMMC, 80% of you will fail because you thought you were doing the right thing, but you, this is something that is more, much more comprehensive than you understand. And you need help to get through to, to do this. Um, in order to be, be in compliance, you need to locate and identify your CUI. You have to categorize it then you have to implement the required controls. That's all the NIST 800171. You have to have a documented security plan, a security plan that actually details specifically how you are implementing those controls. The biggest problem that I've run into is people think they're doing it correctly. And, and oftentimes what they do is they just regurgitate back <laughs> the control statement that's in the NIST 800171. Um, as a three PAO for Fed 
ramp, I've actually come across a lot of companies that they're doing the same thing you are, but at a much stricter scale. And you'd be amazed at the problems that they've had trying to uh, interpret what the control is supposed to be doing and then detailing and describing exactly how they're doing it. And then they have to actually show they're doing it. And that's the same things with the CMMC. You have to detail it. You have to talk the talk and then walk the talk and show that you're doing it with your system, system security plan. Your employees have to be able to do it and they have to be trained. And then you have to monitor your systems and you have to assess your systems and processes on a regular basis. So the, the 800-171 was a nice self-assessment attestation where they said, all right, we're doing this. That's where everybody says, yeah, we're following this and we're doing it right. Well, now, unfortunately, there is the cybersecurity maturity model certification program that has come out. And well, Lauren, I, I want to yeah. touch on something that you, you, you brought up in that, in that last slide there. Many of our government contractors, if you think about what you do for the government, you're bringing expertise to them so that they don't have to do it, right? That's what most government contractors do. They have expertise in a specific area. And while the government could figure out how to do that on their own, it makes more sense to hire an expert to do this. And that's what we're telling you. So my organization, we have RPOs on staff. So they've been through the cyber maturity model certification program so that they know everything that goes into making your company certifiable. And Lauren can talk a little bit about that, but there, you know, I like to say there's four phases to this process. There's the evaluation. You know, we tell you what's wrong. There's remediation. We fix what's wrong. There's certification. So somebody like Lauren, who's a C3PAO, will have the credentials to actually certify that you have done everything properly. And I can't do that for the work that I've done. I have to use someone like Lauren to get that piece done. And then, as he just mentioned, there's ongoing monitoring because this isn't a one and done. This is, this is going to be ongoing. And every few years, you're going to have to show the government again, hey, I'm still following the guidelines. I'm still following best practices. I'm still doing what I said I was going to do three years ago. Yep. And not only that, there's going to be an annual continuous monitoring activities as well that that probably is not well understood. Um, so and, and so the difference now is that the CMMC is measuring your maturity in the implementation of the security controls. Um, you have processes and then you have practices. And right now what they're looking at is trying to get to a level three, which means you have managed control implementations and your cyber hygiene is in what we call a good state. That's how you will achieve uh, the certification level for that. Um, so right now, the minimum for some CU, CF, uh, F, the CUI types is going to be each practice is documented, including all the lower levels. A policy exists that covers all the activities. And what I mean is there has to be a cybersecurity policy document in your organization that details how you are implementing the specific information security control that's identified. And then you also have an associated cybersecurity uh, plan that also de details and describes that so that when you go for an assessment of some sort, you can be able to present this to the assessor and then they can look at your documentation and understand what you're doing. Right now, there are about 130 practices associated with the level three uh, structure. Um, the model for CMMC has added three additional domains that were different from the 171. So whatever you did for the 171, now you have to also include recovery. You have to include, I think it's uh, maintenance or personnel, so, no, situation awareness, and there's another one, a security assessment. Those have been added into the structure. Um, so they've actually broadened it out. So the shift now is going away from a self-assessment to a third party or external assessment from a C3PAO. The 171 was a, is, a, is the starting point. So you actually have to have had implemented all that before you can actually go on top of what the CMC controls and make sure that, that you've got those in place. 
Um, currently, the timeline was supposed to start last October. However, what has happened is the body that is now governing the CMMC is still trying to roll out the program. So it's going to start coming out eventually as they get more and more uh, of the details defined. But what they're doing right now is they're asking um, organizations to, while they're trying to figure out the whole CMMC program, do another 800 self-attestation of your organization and then make sure that you have a POAM associated with that. Um, and then that will cover you. They want you to do that right now until they get the program up and running full speed. So what's the biggest thing that you have to do? You have to become, in, you have to figure out what you are to, in, in order to become compliant with handling the CUI. And as Mike mentioned, the biggest thing is there's, as he mentioned, there's like four or five steps in order to do this. First thing is you've got to figure out what you have. Secondly, you have to figure out what is your, current implementation of your uh, security controls as you've outlined them and identified them in your system security plan. And then you have to be able to figure out where your gaps are. So right now, the, the, the recommended way to go forward is to get a gap analysis performed of your system and use that as the starting point and then put together a roadmap of, of things that you're going to need to do in order to be in a compliant state. And also so that you can then be certified as you go forward. So the biggest thing is, though, is the question always becomes how much of a company needs to be compliant? Well, this is going to be an answer of it depends. It depends <laughs> on how you have set up your system, whether or not you are doing everything in-house within your organization on your own computer servers and systems, or you've gone up to the cloud and you've set up a tenant, say, in Office 365 or Google, G Suite, or things like that. And then based on that, you need to then figure out how well you've implemented the controls. Um, so the guy, I won't go jump ahead because some of these things really don't help. So what, what we can, so here's how Dell and our partners can help you right now. We can assist you in performing that gap analysis, define your current state, and then put together the roadmap to what you need to do to get to the de desired CMMC state. Then if you need to, as part of that, if you need to stand up a tenant and say Office 365, we can assist you in doing that in terms of configuring it and so forth. Um, that's not the end though. And huh. I've got another cool little tool that uh, Microsoft has developed that I can show you how they are in the position to assist you in achieving CMMC compliance. But this tool will basically show you there's a lot more to be done than just standing up a tenant and thinking you're there and that's going to be it. That's not, that's the end of the, that's not the end of the show. That's, that's, there's much more to it than that. Yeah. Lauren, I, I want to uh, reinforce that a little bit. So you, you mentioned that there's 110 controls in NIST right now, right? So, and we know that CMMC is going to add probably another 20. That, that, that's what we were hearing from DOD. They're still finalizing that piece. Right. But if, if you just work from a NIST perspective for the moment, there's 110 controls or requirements or even projects. I don't care what term you want to use. So there's a lot that goes into that. And Advantage is using a product called FutureFeed to compile that data for our clients and understand of the 110 how many do they need? Well, and I was sharing this with Lauren yesterday. Most of the people that we have run that for are scoring around negative 220. <laughs> I mean, so we have yet to have somebody have a positive number, but let's say they did have a positive number, had a positive number of five. That means there's still 105 projects that need to be worked through. And as Lauren just said, Microsoft does a great job of addressing about 20 or so of those, if I'm not mistaken, but that still leaves 90. There's a lot of work. Yep, indeed. And, and so what I'd like to do now is I'm going to shift my sharing over to a different screen and I'll show you this, this tool that Microsoft has created. Um, give me one second. And there it is. So let me know if you can see this. Yep. 
We see okay, it. Great. So what you're looking at is Microsoft has developed what they call a placemat. And this placemat is a listing of all the controls that are now required for the CMMC level three. And based on this, these are all the various controls right here. If you were to look at this map right now, um, you see the AC controls, you see asset management, audit and accountability, awareness training, configuration management, identification and authentication, and so on. So if you were to right out of the box, open up and put in an Office 365 tenant, you would, based on what Microsoft is showing here, obtain control compliance with everything that's in green and partial attainment with the orange squares. So that's just right out of the box. Then based on their licensing, you have the ability to attain even higher levels of control compliance. And so if, for instance, you were to get a Microsoft E3 license, this now shows you where you can get containment for this many of the controls that are out there. So for the primary service, that's about 70 of the controls. The secondary service, you get 32 of the controls. Um, available enablers, you still have about 15 out there, but there are still 54 controls out there that are not covered by this at this level. If you were to go to the E5 licensing, you get a few more, but it hasn't changed. You still have a lot of work. And this is what we were talking about earlier in terms of just standing up a tenant in Office 365 does not take you to the level that you need to do. There's so much more work to do. If you look at the asset management, you look at audit and accountability, you look at uh, personnel security, physical security. There are a number of items here that are gonna just require attention from you that you probably didn't even know existed or you thought you were doing it, but you better make sure that you're doing it right because otherwise you're not gonna pass that CMMC certification process. So uh, this is just to illustrate for you what you can get just by setting up the MCC, uh, that level three. However, there's something else to, to understand too though. Just because you've turned on and you've gotten that licensing level, it does not mean that you are compliant. There are configuration settings that need to be done when you go into and stand at that tenant. Um, this is just for the Microsoft product. There's also, apparently people are still looking at the Google G Suite and <laughs> I'm not quite sure if that's going to be compliant or not. Um, when we were talking, Mike and I were yesterday about the Google G Suite and Right now, we haven't seen any indication from Google that they're going to go out and achieve um, the certification. They haven't said anything, yes or no. Right, right. And, and so what's happening right now is if you've got a product that you're using that has been um, approved and is certified through FedRAMP, those are going to be approved and certified into the CMMC program. Um, Anything that's not is going to have to go through a certification process of its own from the CMMC governing body in order to be approved to be a platform for which you can do things. So if you're looking for a cloud service provider that can be your um, tenant that, if you will, for your email and your file shares and everything else, that's great. But one of the things that needs to be considered, and this goes back to what we we're talking about earlier, is what is what, what are the boundaries of your system? Are you still pulling the data down into your environment on your normal network, in turn your office and so forth? Because if you are, you've just expanded your boundary into your office space. And now everything that's there has to go on, fall under the same umbrella of controls. And you have to demonstrate that you're doing the same thing there. So this just opens things up real wide. So the key thing is for you to figure out what is your boundary, figure out, can you keep it there? And if you can't, you have to expand into your office. Then you have to figure out all the controls that go around that. And Warren, so you just made a really good point that I, I want to emphasize to our audience. Let's say that you are one of those people that set up virtual machines in the cloud. So you're just imaging to a local terminal, right? Right. Have you also set it up so that local terminal can't save anything locally? Have you restricted that? Because if you haven't, then you have the problem that you just laid out, right? Right. 
And again, there are so many little details. Like, for example, multi-factor authentication comes with Microsoft, right? Every single Microsoft license comes with multi-factor authentication. 70% of companies I meet with are not using that. They haven't turned it on. They haven't bothered to. It's included. If you know, if you have any sort of tech savvy, you as you can do, you can turn that on for your company. It takes you 15 minutes per person, maybe to get it set up, but it's a one and done. Right. And they're and they're not doing that. Correct. And and the, the, the other thing is too, there's a lot more that's associated with that. If you set up a tenant in the cloud and you set up virtual machines, not just desktops, but you've got to have your data somewhere. And nope. so are you setting up in a SharePoint somewhere or anything like that? There's a lot of other things that go into this as well. Are you monitoring for security information and events that might be taking place? So what that means is, do you have what is called a SIM tool? Are you using one of those as part of your process for maintaining your, your tenant wherever you have it stood up? Are you, do, are you doing vulnerability management? What does that mean? Is it, are you scanning your devices with a, an approved scanning tool to ensure that patching has been maintained, that configurations are up to speed and that you, you keep up with it because new patches are released all the time. All kinds of things are coming out, not just with operating system patches, but third-party products. And you have to have all those patched and updated and maintained. So that's another process that's part of this whole realm of security controls and ensuring that you're doing these things and that you have it up there. So, you know, these are just things that you, if you have not been doing them already, and then you think you're compliant with the NIST 800 I I ask you to go back and rethink that because that's, there's, there's so much to this that, that's not even there. So, um, let's see. So that, anyway, going back to this placemat, uh, this is what you can obtain, but Again, it takes a lot more. There's configurations that needs to be done. There's a security uh, center that will do a compliance check with you <clears throat> if you set up a tenant in Office 365. But I, again, going back to what we were talking about with Google Suite, I don't know if they're going to get certified. So that's something to think about. If you are there now using Google and you realize that you're going to have to maybe switch over to something else, think about all the transition crop, the transfer transformation costs that you're going to have to do to go from one platform to the other as part of that. And I'm not trying to not sell Google. I'm not trying to sell Microsoft. I'm just saying Microsoft and there's a whole range of products out there that have been approved. There is something called the FedRAMP marketplace. If you look that up, you can see all of the different companies that have been approved at one level or another, a moderate level or higher for uh, selling to the government. Those products, I would encourage you to go through that and use those things as part of building out your environment to making sure that you're using the things that are, are there. And then you also have to think about if you're using these cloud products and environments, where your data is, if you have metadata about your systems that you are now, say you're using a vulnerability scanning system that's up, located up in the cloud. If that a company has not been FedRAMP authorized, there's a lot of information that's going out about your system or that data or something like that that's moving to a platform that they're not going to be too thrilled about uh, using because they don't know what the controls are in place about that. And so they're going to be a little leery. I, I can tell you just from the FedRAMP side of things that this is going to happen with the CMMC as the, this whole program matures and builds out going down the road. So um, are there any questions right now about? Yeah, we have four actually. So why don't we stop for a moment? Okay. Uh, so the first one uh, from Michael McMaster. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. What is the status CMMC audit infrastructure? How many certified auditors are available? I don't believe that there are any at this time. I believe that the program has been put on hold and they're still trying to get the the whole certification process worked out. Um, I may be wrong. I know that's what was the status a couple months ago, but yeah, they, I will think be, you're right. they will be finalizing that program and moving forward. So in terms of getting certified at this moment, the chances are good that, they're, that the organizations are, are not ready for that to occur. That's why they released in September 
the information out to everybody. Go back, if you haven't done in the last three years, uh, 800 self-assessment, do that and put your poem together and go forward. What we recommend is that get a third party, such as our partners at Dell or Dell or someone to come in and assess you in terms of the readiness. Someone who is familiar with what these controls actually mean and actually can say to you, this is where you are in terms of the uh, implementation and this is what you need to do for each specific control to get to that level. So right now it's more of co consultation from external organizations to assist you. And yeah. then shortly, probably sometime later this year, they'll start the certification process in earnest. Yeah, Lauren, that's a great point because, again, my, my company is an RPO. And we have certified team members to do that work because the DOD recognizes nobody's ready right now. Nobody's ready to be certified. Maybe some people are close, but nobody's truly ready. So they, they haven't finalized that piece, and they're still working on what are those few CMMC controls are going to be that are in addition to NIST. So right. those are the two th important things to remember. But people like Lauren have already been through the C3PAO training, so they are ready to take that step once the DOD has made their final points for this program. And then, of course, my company, Advantage, we're there to help you with the gap evaluation and with the remediation. And I can't stress how important the remediation is, particularly to have somebody with an RPO, because should you go to someone like Lauren and say, hey, I'd like my certification. And when he has the ability to give you that certification, runs his audit and you fail. Well, it's not like, okay, well, I just spend another X amount of thousands of dollars and try again. No, there's a waiting period because you have to go back and not start all over, but it's going to be extensive. It's going to be thorough. You know, one, one of the big investment items that Lauren and I talked about is having a seam. You know, most of you have not thought about having one in the past. That's something, that's an investment that you're going to make in your organization if you are serious about working with the DOD and getting your CMMC. Correct. Yeah. If you don't have a SING tool, if you don't have a vulnerability scanning management program in place, then you're going to have a lot of work to do. Um, there are managed security service providers that can assist you with that and they can probably take on that work for you. But especially if you're a smaller organization, um, the, the real tragedy of this whole thing is this is not how you used to do business. Um, unfortunately, the onus has been put back on you now to tighten up. Um, the government is so tired of seeing the ransomware attacks. I'm, one of the services I do with Dell is I go in and assist companies recover from a ransomware attack. We come in, we've got forensics guys, we've got um, all sorts of engineers and such that come in. And it is not a good thing to go in there and essentially see a company that's been brought to its knees by a ransomware attack their assistants are no longer available. Um, they've been compromised and they don't know what to do. And so it's a lot of work. And so you don't want to be in that position. And that's what this whole program is, is coming out to do is to help make sure that all of the dibs and all of the, down the road, all of the uh, federal contractors are implementing some sort of security program. Uh, for so long, security has been thought of as an overhead and that organizations didn't want to put any money into it and didn't do any spend. And we now see what the end results are of that with all the ransomware attacks that we're seeing out there. You'd be surprised. I go into a lot of big companies and you would think by the name of the company that they would probably have a very sh uh, mature security program in place. They don't. Uh, nope. It's scary uh, just to know and just to see that thing. And so uh, that's just, just the reality. I mean, a lot of companies think that, oh, we're going to do a 10% IT overall budget spend on security. And that's what I think is the industry norm. And I'm not saying that that's the correct number. I think that's under, especially these days. Um, that has been what overall average company spend has been. And that's, to me, it's, it's underspend, unfortunately. So... Lauren, I'm glad you brought up ransomware because that's what's making the news right now, right? Whether it's solar winds or, you know, the list goes on and on of companies that have been attacked. But very candidly, the DOD is doing this.
because they're tired of seeing their blueprints show up someplace else on the other side of the globe going, wait a minute, isn't that our fighter jet that we were working on? Why, why is fill in the blank company rolling one out that looks exactly like it? Because that's not, that's more of the, the spy side of things, right? You know, that's, hey, we're not trying to shut you down. We're just trying to steal your stuff and make sure you don't know about it. Yep. And this attack that just was announced last this week uh, regarding the exchange servers, this is uh, has been in place now going on for about, I would say, several months. And Microsoft just released the patches this week to patch up the exchange servers. But advanced persistent threat actors have exploited these on a, on thousands of companies in this country. Problem is, I don't think everybody really knows if they've been exploited or not, because yeah. what happens is when you get exploited, they're not going to come in and just shut everything down. No, their biggest job is to exfiltrate your data. They just want to sit in the back. They want to sit in the dark and watch. And just they want your crown happens. jewels. They want yep. to get, they want to get whatever they can. They may not even try to, uh, put ransomware on your systems and, and shut you down. They, they're trying to get the information and steal it. And if you've got an opening up to another company that has other things through some sort of VPN or something like that, they're going to want to try traverse into their environments. And that's why it's going to go from the federal agencies, contractors, subcontractors. Everybody's got to get certified because they don't want that lateral movement going through tunnels into other organizations. I once did a security assessment for OPM on one of their systems. And the, one of the contracting agencies was, I can't remember the name of it, but they, they were developed and established to do all the background investigations of everybody in the United States as the main contractor for OPM. I assess one of their systems. And one of the things I learned is that they had a VPN set up going into, this was back many, many years ago. So I, I'll talk about it now because it's already been well known, established and, and what happened. But essentially the, the, the contractor had a VPN into the government agency, hit a, a, a switch, and then they went over into the data in other areas. When I, asked about the controls that are around that connection coming in, they didn't have to be monitoring over that connection coming in or the activity that went through there. So nobody saw the exploit that took place on the, the contractor who then came in through. And now my fingerprints, your fingerprints, anybody who's had a security clearance going back quite a few years, all your information was, was taken by the probably Chinese or the Russians. I'm not quite sure which one it was, <laughs> but they got it. They have it. And so I, that's just the, that's the greatest risks that those, that's the background of why this stuff is starting to take place uh, with greater scrutiny from the feds and the DOD. Yep. And, and Lauren, we have three more questions all from uh, Shamshul Kalik. And if I mispronounce your name, uh, I am so sorry about that. Uh, but the first one, how does Azure Blueprints help us becoming compliant? So looking at the uh, placemat you're seeing right here, mm -hmm. the Azure Blueprint, essentially, by enabling the Blueprint, it will tell you what are the security controls, settings, configurations that need to be done within your tenant in Azure in order to achieve the level of compliance to meet that specific control. So Microsoft has developed these blueprints, and if you go out to their website, you can find the blueprints, and then you can use those as a template for building out the configurations within your systems. All right, and the next question, do we have some predefined policies and configurations that you can export and import for NIST compliance? And Lauren, you and I talked a little bit about this. There are plenty of templates out there, right, that you yes. can use to start but the key is you really have to read through them carefully and make sure that they fit your company specifically. Because if they're too general, they're not going to pass muster. Correct. And also there's compliance checkers built into Azure that you can enable and it will give you a, a score of how you are set up at the moment. So those things are available to use. Um, you can use... Uh, vulnerability scanning or compliance scanning tools like Nessus or other ones 
to see if your systems are currently um, configured correctly. And you can use bench line checkers. The CIS Center for in, in, uh, Internet Security has bench lines, uh, benchmarks that you can use with their scanning tool to, to scan against your systems to see if you are configured correctly. And if not, they'll give you recommendations on how to go forth and, and use those um, settings to your advantage to get compliance. All right. And his last question, what is the work that needs to be done for an out-of-box GCC high tenant to make sure it is NIST 800-171 compliant? All right. So let's go back to the start here. Okay. Um, the manual. This mm -hmm. is where you are out of the box. Okay. And then, so everything that's in gray is they're available to be enabled to help you reach that level of compliance. And that's just straight out of the box. Now, depending on which licensing level you go to, sure. you'll get more uh, in, immediate, um, what I want to call it, primary services that are available that can meet the needs for this. But if you look right now, over half, only about a little bit more than half you can use to get to that advantage. To that advantage. And this is with an E3 licensing right here. Mm -hmm. This is the E5 licensing. Added in a few more. Still, there are over 50 some odd, <laughs> 60 some odd controls that it doesn't matter if you have the tenant set up or anything like that. You have a lot of work to do on your own with everything else that goes around it. I'll just pick on IR4. So what that is, is let's see if that will do it. Yeah. Um, this is a IR4-.100. Um, the description is use knowledge of tactics, tactics, techniques, and procedures in incident response, planning, and execution. What does that mean? Okay, well, first what it means is you have to have an incident response plan in place that an assessor will look at and says, yeah, this meets the requirements for what we need for incident response. So right there, the CMMC level three out of the box GCC high tenant can't do anything for you about incident response because that's a manual. That's a, that's an operational activity. Or a service that, that you buy. Do. Yeah. Yeah. This is, and this is what we're talking about. All these very various different activities that you're going to have to do. Let me see. Let me pick on AU 4.053. You have to automate the analysis of audit logs to identify and act on critical indicators of uh, attack and or organiz organizationally defined suspicious activity. That thing just said a, rot, a lot right there. So what are your organizationally defined suspicious activities? Have you identified those? Have you listed them out in your SSP? And then you have set your, de your devices that are auditing your systems to capture those logs. Where are you putting all those logs? That's what we go back to that SIM tool we're talking about. The CMMC level three GCC high tenant has nothing to do with the SIM logs or anything else like that, or the monitoring of it or everything else that goes around that. So that's where a lot of work has to come in about this thing. So, so Lauren, I want to summarize <laughs> what you just so wonderfully illustrated. NIST as it stands right now, 110 controls. I've said that like six times now. <laughs> Not all controls are created equal. Some controls are very inexpensive and okay. very simple and won't take a lot of time. Some controls are very expensive and very time consuming. But if you are missing one of the 110 controls, you do not get fruit cup. <laughs> you don't win. You do not pass go. You do not collect $200. And I think that's the point that people need to understand that it's every control. It's not most of them. It's not in the HIPAA world, they call it reasonable and appropriate action, right? But that's not th this world. This is yes or no. It is done or it is not done. And if it is not done, then you don't pass. Right. And then what you have is a plan of actions and milestones list of everything that you're going to need to do when you didn't pass. And that's a tragedy because what you've just done is you went for your CMMC certification. You weren't ready and you spent, there's a lot of money that's spent on these things to get to that level. Just the certification themselves 
the the assessment is not cheap. It's a, probably a three to six week endeavor, depending on the size and scope of your environment that the assessor has to come in and go through all the controls and analyze all your data, all your plans, all your security plans, everything else. If you fail, what you just did was paid for a very expensive readiness assessment of your system. If you take the time up front and work with a consultant to get yourself positioned to be certified, you will save a lot of headache and then when you do get to that point for your certification assessment, you'll be in a much better place and you'll be sleeping a little bit better at night knowing that you are, are ready to get there and then you won't miss out on contracts and everything else. I can tell you right now, some of the three uh, FedRAMP clients that we've gone through, they've spent money on very expensive readiness assessments because they weren't ready and they thought they were. And so this is just something that, you know, takes a lot of time. It takes some help. You need somebody to Sherpa you through the, the environment and get you <laughs> understanding what, what is what and what it means. So uh, Lauren, I, I, I'm going to wrap up with just this, this final little fun story. And then I'll ask for your closing thoughts. I am a salesperson by definition. So I spend a lot of time reaching out to prospective clients and the number of people who I know need CMMC that have given me fill in the blank reason why it doesn't apply to them. This one particular. So this gentleman is the president of a small government contractor and he, he lives in Hawaii. How awesome is that? Right. Lives in Hawaii, but he's from Baltimore. That's how I originally found him. And I, I sent him an email and I said, Steve, I'm going to make his name up. We're going to call him Steve. I said, Hey Steve, you know, it's Mike Sheila did some research on your company. I see that you're a government contractor wanted to talk to you about your CMMC preparation. And the email back to me was, thanks, Mike, we're all set. And I wrote back and I said, Hey Steve, I appreciate you getting back to me, but generally when people write back to me, we're all set. It tells me a, they didn't read my email or B they don't know what CMMC is. And I, so I came up with this little like two sentence statement saying, basically, if you are a government contractor working with the DOD, CMMC is a requirement. And again, it's going to take you about nine months. It's going to be a significant investment. So you need to start working on it now. And he got back to me and said, well, well, we have an IT company. (laughs) So I wrote back, I said, Steve, I'm sorry. I still don't think you're reading my email or I'm doing a very poor job of explaining myself. But this is something that you have to do if you want to continue to work with the Department of Defense. So he called me and said, hey, Mike, you know, thank you so much for the emails. But just want to let you know, you know, we're a small shop. We only have like six guys. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really we're only on the aviation side of the business. And like he gave me like six disclaimers. And I said, OK, Steve, I'm going to ask you. Does any of that have anything to do with bids or contracts from the Department of Defense? He goes, well, yeah, all of it. I said, then you need to start working on this. You you don't have an option unless you're going to stop being a government contractor and you're going to go into the commercial space. And one of the things, I think I shared this with you, one of the things is we think a lot of these smaller government contractors are going to merge with larger ones because they, they just, they don't have the, like, I don't have the quarter of a million or half a million dollars to put all of this infrastructure and security measures in place so that I can get my business running the way it should be. And there was this really awkward silence from him on the phone. He goes, well, I guess I need to talk to my partners about this and I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, and, and that's, that's what I, I hope our listening audience today is getting that from Lauren and I. Yeah, Lauren and I are salespeople. We want to sell stuff. We, we, we absolutely do. I'm, I'm not trying to mask that and say anything else. But what I am saying is this is critical to the future success of your business. And not only is it critical, but it's required. And this isn't like, best practices or, hey, this is a really good idea. This is going to determine whether or not you are successful in 2021 and beyond. So Lauren, your parting thoughts. Thank you again so much for the content today. This has been nothing short of brilliant. I uh, 
all I can say is I totally agree with you in terms of if you want to continue to do business with the government, you're going to have to do this. You have a long road to go down in order to get prepared if you have not started or if you kind of like put the tinsel on the tree thinking that that was getting you to the 171 compliance level. Um, it's unfortunate that this is the thing, you know, for years, as I was saying earlier, uh, companies just thought of IT security as overhead and those days are gone. Um, you now need to show that you are mature enough in your practices. And this is not just checking the box. This is showing the level of implementation is managed and you're mature. And without having that capability and that able to demonstrate that you're not going to pass. And it's, un, it's, it's a, it's, it's a scary thought for a lot of small companies, like you're saying. Um, the biggest key thing is figuring out how you need to set yourself up in order to be in compliance. And you're going to need some advice from somebody to tell you really what's the best way to go about that. And basically, it's your boundary. Where, where are you set up? So. Lauren, I'm going to give you one more great question. It's actually a couple of questions from one person in the chat box. So it's first, how do you determine which level of compliance for an information system? And second, does CMMC require a written description of your system boundaries or can an organization just reference its systems diagram? I have a few thoughts on this, but I'm, I'd love to hear yours. So it, again, it goes back to that whole question of what type of information do you have and where is it stored? So there's a lot of companies that are going to be level one. They just need to meet the, the minimum requirements for level one because they're really not doing a lot and it's just contract language. Anything that starts to rise above that is going to take you up to the next levels to get you to, and, and essentially if you've got data, it's going to, there's going to be a, a like a, checklist that you'll have to go through with your data in order to determine what you have that rises to that level. It is controlled unclassified information, CUI. Yeah. And so if it's information that you have from the government and you're using it, or you're doing stuff that you're working with the government and selling to them, but that blueprint, that uh, the database that's in there, the, the, the IP that's behind whatever services that you're doing with the government, that needs to be protected so that it, if there are vulnerabilities within it that can be exploited and the government entity is using that, they need to know about that. So it's just going to depend on what, what we're looking at here. The level three is probably a moderate level system. Um, so, it, you know, that's the level when we, we're looking at from a low, moderate to a high level system. Levels four and five on the CMMC maturity mark, uh, chart are coming down the road later. Those are organizations that have a lot of information that they're doing. Research information, uh, government contracting information of certain sources is all going to rise to at least a level three. So that's that's the one thing. And what was the second question then? Yeah, so I'll, I'll read that in just a second, but I want to put a point on what you just went through because that was fantastic. When in doubt, level three. Right. Yeah because every piece of feedback that we have gotten at Advantage Industries is somewhere around 90%, 9-0 of the bids that are going to come out will be CMMC level three. Yep. Levels four and five are few and far between, and those are really high security clearance. And then with that, level one is also very few because they just don't have a ton of impact. And all level two does is indicate that you are working your way towards level three. So there will be some bids that come out that will accept level two for the bidding process, but you have an agreement that you will be at level three by the time the bid is awarded. That's essentially the layout of the five layers. So for our listening audience and our viewing audience, level three is your best default. Uh, maybe you have questions around level five and Lauren and I are happy to field those individually if you want to reach out to us. But level three is the place to be. You know, that, that's a good way to look at it. And this, the last question was, does CMC require written description of your system boundaries or can an organization just reference its systems diagram? No. <laughs> the, you have to have a well-developed system security plan 
that's within included within that is your boundary diagram. But within the system security plan, you have to detail all the components within your system, how they're configured, how they're set up, the di boundary diagram just as an illustration visual that helps a lot of people understand what's going on. You won't be able to just refer to that. That system security plan then has to go through for every single one of these controls. So let's go back and pick on AU.4.0.53. And it says automated analysis of audit logs to identify and act on critical indicators. You have to describe in detail how you are implementing that control. What is the system, what is the tool? Since this says automated, that requires a tool. What tool are you using to go through that? So you can't just refer to your boundary diagram and that's it, that, that's not, that will not work, so. Well, again, Lauren, thank you so much for your content today. Nothing short of fantastic, and which is what I expected. Uh, for our viewing audience, our listening audience, please know if you wanna to talk to myself or Lauren, you can reach us. We have an email set up just for this program. It is answers at getadvantage.com. So send an email to answers at getadvantage.com. And if it's a Lauren specific question, I will make sure that he gets it. And if it's something that I can help you with at Advantage Industries, I will respond promptly. So again, for Dell and for Advantage Industries, uh, thank you all so much for attending today's webinar on CMMC and NIST and the differences between. Be sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel because we are doing this every month and we will have another great subject matter expert like Lauren for you next month to learn more about technology and cybersecurity. Thank you everyone for your time today.